So again, um, hello everyone and, and thank you for joining us for this UNEP and Minamata journey towards a mercury free planet. Uh, we're really pleased to be able to to put on this side event and really pleased to have such a great uh, panel uh, for for your enlightenment on this really interesting topic. Um, next year will mark the 50th anniversary of the creation of the United Nations Environment Program at the 1972 UN Conference uh, on the Human Environment in Stockholm, Sweden. Fast forward to 2017 and the Minamata Convention on Mercury entered into force and we can draw a straight line from one to the other. Um, and for me, looking at the news clips of that really transformative week in Stockholm, I was very struck by the, the presence and the, the profound influence of Minamata disease victims of indigenous peoples and civil society all calling for action on mercury, among the other important issues at hand at that meeting. Uh, I had the, the privilege to be part of the Minamata Convention negotiations from their start. Uh, and like other multilateral environmental agreements, we were guided by the science and the data, not just about the devastating health effects of mercury, but also how it behaves in the environment, travels long distances, which sectors are responsible for mercury use, emissions and releases, both globally and regionally, and more. The convention negotiators took a, a rather bold step of directly addressing an informal sector, and that is artisanal and small scale gold mining, and crafting really practical adaptive steps for parties to take on this issue recognizing that the role that this sector plays in the lives of, of many millions of people. And along with its obligations on a wide range of sectors and issues that impact all of us in our everyday lives, the steps that were set forth in this important example of environmental governance are really practical and achievable. So, so it's really a, a pleasure for me to be able to draw this linkage between uh, the convention that's near and dear to my heart uh, and, and the really strong uh, and amazing history that went before it starting uh, in Stockholm. And, and just to say, this is, this is not just wishful thinking about taking these practical and achievable steps. Uh, the, the triple planetary crisis is also a, a triple planetary opportunity to use the tools of multilateral environmental governance. So without further delay, we have prepared a very short video for you to illustrate this theme. Over to the video, thank you. Stockholm, Sweden, June 12, 1972. Mrs. Indira Gandhi, Prime Minister of India, arrived today to address the first United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. It is clear that the environmental crisis which is confronting the world will profoundly alter the future destiny of our planet. No one amongst us, whatever our status, strength or circumstance, can remain unaffected. We are facing a planetary emergency that has been generations in the making. One that threatens the future of life as we know it. The climate crisis, the biodiversity and nature crisis, the pollution and waste crisis. We must act together before we reach the point of no return. But we know what needs to be done. For 50 years, UNEP has been working with the global community to safeguard the environment. Experience shows us that inclusive multilateralism is more effective than going it alone. We came together to protect the ozone layer with the Montreal Protocol, which was in danger of collapsing by the mid 21st century, but is now on track to return to pre-1980s levels 
by the 2060s. With the Minamata Convention, the international community agreed to phase out mercury. And in 2020, a global ban on the trade of most mercury-added products came into force. In the 1990s, UNEP realized the importance of integrating sustainability into the global finance sector. Now, UNEP Finance Initiative's members include over 365 banks, insurers, and investors working with governments to invest in a sustainable future. Countries are cooperating like never before to stop the trade in endangered species. And since its inception, no CITES listed species has ever become extinct as a result of trade. As we look towards a post-pandemic future, emissions and temperatures continue to rise and we must rise to the challenge to protect people and planet. 50 years of experience has shown us that when we work together, we can make change. It is possible. Thank you to, to all our colleagues for creating that wonderful video. I'd like to turn to our first um, panelist, and that is Mr. Juan Bello. Juan has 25 years of professional experience, mostly related to biodiversity, environmental assessments, and science policy platforms. Juan uh, joined UNEP in 2015 as a coordinator for the science division in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, in 2017, he was the head of the project office in Colombia and regional focal point for Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. And since June 2020, he has supported the regional office's senior advisor on biodiversity uh, and ecosystems, where he facilitated the adoption of the regional action plan for ecosystems rest restoration by the form of ministers of environment of Latin America and the Caribbean, and Juan is now the coordinator for UNEP Plus 50. So he, he has he has additional amazing achievements that I'm not going to list here because I want to give him plenty of time to speak. So Juan, thank you for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Marianne, for the invitation. is It's a it's a big honor to be in this side event with these wonderful speakers that are joining us today and with all the participants that are connected. Um, I would like to, to start just uh, mentioning that 50 years ago, it, it was a, a realization that environmental problems are of global nature and that as such, they require global action and that only through the multilateral dialogue, uh, negotiation, agreements, and overall global action is possible to address them. That realization is as true today as it was 50 years ago, and, and today is very much needed. So that's the foundation of all what have all of us together in these conversations, in these discussions, 
And a big part of that has been the, um, the way we collectively use science, we use evidence to understand environmental problems and, and to understand the impacts of those problems and to, and to try to understand how um, to address them and, and how the future would look like if they are not addressed. And as you probably know, the, um, all the issues related to chemicals, to uh, pollutants, were very much since the very beginning of uh, the creation of this uh, global environmental architecture and the establishment of UNEP. And this is why we can, we can say that, that UNEP uh, has been working on the issue of mercury for a long, long time. And just uh, well before the negotiations that ended up in the establishment of the Minamata Convention, being that the youngest of all the multilateral environmental agreements that, that we have today, uh, UNEP was there facilitating that dialogue and providing the science for global action. So I just want to highlight that, for instance, in 2005, UNEP established the UNEP Global Mercury Partnership, which is a network of over 200 partners, a global network that brings unique expertise and value uh, to the understanding of the problems around the mercury. And through that is contributing to global action and supporting the convention and beyond. UNEP is, is also providing the secretariat for the UNEP Global Mercury Partnership. UNEP has also been at the origin of a number of flagship reports and tools, including uh, UNEP's Global Mercury Assessments developed since 2002, which informed the negotiations in their discussions and supported the development of the convention. We have further seen great advancements in the development of the Minamata Convention uh, to respond to mercury pollution. And indeed, we see this as a unique tool for protecting human health and the environment from the adverse effects of mercury through its life cycle approach by taking measures across the entire life cycle, um, including from, from mining to its disposal. So, uh, as I said, the science policy interface has been one of the major roles in which UNEP has been involved into all this. And this is, this is a key component of the framework of action for, for UNEP. So, as mandated by the um, resolution 48 of the United Nations Environmental Assembly on sound management of chemicals and waste, UNEP has been a, an advocate for the need to urgently strengthen the science policy interface at all levels, including the support and promotion of science-based local, national, regional, and global action. UNEP also has developed a report on the assessment of options for strengthening the science policy interface at the national level. And this assessment report seeks to facilitate and inform discussions on how to strengthen this interface, specifically in the area of science management, sound management of chemicals and waste. So basically what we are saying is that through an organization such as UNIP, um, we reaffirm our commitment to the use of science in monitoring progress, setting priorities, and supporting policy making throughout the whole life cycle of chemicals and waste, taking into account the gaps and scientific information, especially in developing countries. Now, we have also seen that, um, and especially, uh, I, I would say that this, this comes also from the, our reality now with the COVID-19 pandemic. It is absolutely clear that the three dimensions of sustainable development are inherently interlinked, interconnected. So as science is telling us, mercury pollution in itself 
is a cross-cutting issue. It undercuts the sustainable development goals on good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, decent work, a work and economic growth, a life a below water, life on land, and many more. Uh, there, there are clear connections with health problems uh, that can threaten the development of unborn and young children. So as we strive to overcome this triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature and biodiversity loss and pollution that the world is facing today, we need this kind of transformation and transformational change in how we deal with these challenges. And for that, we need to make sure that we continue promoting an integrated and coherent approach in addressing the drivers of environmental problems. And this is why there is this uh, connection between the work that UNEP does and the work of the conventions such as Minamata Convention. So, so we are uh, really delighted of seeing how this is working as part of a global environmental uh, multilateralism and a global uh, environmental governance. So with that, I, I stop my intervention. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, those were really enlightening remarks and, and really um, sounded like the UNEP and the experience that I recall as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to turn now to Mr. Yasuhisha Kitagawa, pardon me. He is the deputy head of mission for the Embassy of Japan in Kenya, and we are really honored to have him here tonight. So, Mr. Kitagawa, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marianne, uh, program director. Your pronunciation of my name is good. Thank you. Can you Sorry. hear me? <laughs> yeah, it's quite it's quite quiet. So if you just speak up a bit, we'll hear you. I think yes. better. Right. Uh, uh, good evening and uh, good morning and uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Yasuhisa Kitagawa. Uh, I'm the deputy chief of mission of the Japanese embassy in Kenya and the DPL to the UNEP. Uh, thank you very much. I just would like to express, uh, first of all, uh, my sincere gratitude. Uh, for uh, inviting me to this uh, very important event, uh, journey towards a mercury-free planet, and I extend my congratulations to UNEP and all of us on the achievement in addressing mercury and other environmental pollutants since the UNEP's inspe uh, inception in 1972. Uh, I would like to welcome vigorous circumstances of the UNEP at 50. Uh, UNEP at 50 uh, provides an opportunity uh, to reinvigorate the international cooperation and spur collective momentum to address the triple uh, planetary crisis through climate action, uh, nature action, and chemicals, and the pollution action. Uh, Japan experienced heavy industrial pollution, including the mercury poisoning called Minamata disease in the uh, 1950s and 60s, as you know. Uh, environmental uh, laws and regulations were established in late 1960s and early 1970s. The Environment Agency, now the Ministry of Environment, uh, was established in 1971. Uh, the United Nations Human Environment Conference in Stockholm was held as the first global gathering on the environment in 1972. Uh, as the International uh, Environmental Governance Development uh, developed since the Stockholm Conference, environment uh, governments developed uh, uh, since then the pollution, uh, environmental pollution by toxic uh, substances, including mercury, has been at the center uh, of the global challenges. Uh, the Stockholm Declaration on Human Environmental established a principle that discharge of toxic substances should not exceed the capacity of the environment. 20 years later, uh, the world leaders gathered in Rio de Janeiro in 1992 uh, for the Earth Summit. The Agenda 21 adopted in Rio uh, included the chapter 
on the sound management of uh, toxic chemicals, which called for the uh, phasing out or banning of chemicals that are toxic, persistent, and uh, bioaccumulative. In 2002, the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg WSSD uh, adopted the plan of implementation, congratulated on the adoption of the Stockholm Convention uh, on Persistent Organic Pollutants, and committed to the risk reduction of toxic heavy metals such as mercury. Uh, Rio or Plus 20 in 2012 was held in the midst uh, of the global move towards Minamata Convention and the outcome document, The Future We Want, uh, called the, for the success of that negotiation. As you all can appreciate, uh, Minamata Convention on Mercury is a convention that holds a special place in the heart of the Japanese people. Uh, during its negotiations, Japan hosted the second intergovernmental negotiations conference in Chiba and a plenipotentiary diplomatic conference in Kumamoto in October 2013. Uh, Mr. Fumio Kishida, Minister for Foreign Affairs then, and who is now the Prime Minister uh, of Japan, uh, signed the convention. Uh, since 2020, uh, Japan is collaborating uh, with the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, to provide technical support to strengthen the capacity for mercury assessment and monitoring in 10 countries in Asia and Pacific, uh, including the COP4 uh, host country, Indonesia. Uh, we lead the development and the integration of the of mercury management and are happy to share the knowledge, know hows with others uh, to protect uh, people and the planet from harms of mercury. Uh, we are also a strong believer in science-based decision-making and the participatory process for policy formulation uh, and promotion of the compliance. Japan actively uh, supports initiatives such as Global Mercury Program uh, with wide stakeholders' participation with NGOs, the private sector, and academia alike. Beyond Mercury, Japan is proud to be a leader in the environmentally friendly management of hazardous waste, such as PCBs and e-waste, and has provided expertise and financial support to the activities towards the implementation of uh, various uh, multilateral environmental agreements. The UNEP International Environmental Technology Center, IETC, uh, which was established in Osaka, Japan in 1992, uh, plays an important role in providing technical assistance concerning uh, waste management. Uh, Japan has contributed to the Minamata Convention as in demonstrating leadership through these efforts. Uh, however, we could have not come where we stand today uh, without support of those who committed themselves to take this difficult path. Uh, sorry to mention by name only, but our special thanks uh, go to Monica, the Executive Secretary, and uh, Marianne Program Director Yu, uh, who is the, um, uh, the uh, Program Officer for Capacity Building and Technical Assistance of the Minamata Convention Secretariat, and uh, Ms. Hyusun, the program officer, as well as uh, Mr. Bello, the coordination officer for the special session on the UNEP Part 50. As the uh, DPL to UNEP uh, from Japan, um, I have no doubt that UNEP Part 50 will be successful, and uh, I am looking forward to participating in this historical event in March next year. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kitagawa. We we in the world are very grateful for Japan's leadership in the in the development and now the implementation of the Minamata Convention. Um, so we thank you very much for being with us. I would now like to turn to another very active country in our convention, um, and that's uh, Ghana. And uh, we are joined tonight by Mr. Sam Adukumi. 
Uh, he's a director at the Environmental Protection Agency of Ghana, and he has also been very busy this week with us, uh, co-chairing our budget contact group and, and doing numerous other um, important tasks for our COP4. So, Sam, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, we'd love to hear from you right now. Thank you so much for this opportunity to actually talk about about UNEP at 50. I, as already mentioned by people, without UNEP, we wouldn't have any proper environmental protection, which also said that human health. So if you talk about UNEP activities, I believe that um, it spans from so many areas, including climate change, including air and water quality and any other matter or issue that protects human health environment. And because we are talking about being a matter, it means that we're talking about the multilateral environmental agreements, which are chemicals and waste related for that matter, including the Basel, Rotterdam, Stockholm conventions, and being a matter itself, and also even the strategy approach to international chemicals management, CYCHEM which you now we have the Beyond 2020 approach, which are all geared towards the achievement of sustainable development, the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And then um, chemicals have a special place in the, I mean, 12.4 targets of the SDGs. And for that matter, chemicals, we talk about chemicals management in Ghana and chemicals management, as you've mentioned already, really we have a lot of things to share thanks to UNEP. So I want to say that Ghana, for example, supports all the international airports efforts towards achieving the standard of chemicals and waste. And we fully participated in all these negotiations which were initiated by UNEP, I mean, related to the MEAs, and the frameworks on chemicals and waste. And actually, these conventions provide legal frameworks and practical management perspective for safeguard environment. Talking about chemicals and waste, disposal of relevant hazardous chemicals and waste, which are of global concern. And um, through that, we can achieve what they call life cycle management of chemicals, which start from production through disposal and recycling these days. So, the conventions, as already mentioned, the Minamata, the Saikem, the Pops, Rotterdam, and all those things are really helpful, which Ghana has been very active in participation. Um, programs that UNEP, uh, Ghana has enjoyed for UNEP, or even Minamata itself, including the development of what you call the MIA, the Minamata Initial Assessment, which Ghana enjoyed some support from UNEP through the Global Environment Facility, and we had that one in place. And if I want to mention even the, 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 the MIA, which is actually, it helped us to give us some priorities as a nation, because Ghana, as you know, we are a nation that also have ASGM, at sun as mosque gold mining, I mean, as a huge problem, which also, I mean, it pollutes our water bodies and our um, ecosystems. I mean, the environment in general and affecting human population, human health as well. So through even the MIA development that we did, that's thanks to UNEP, we identified five main priorities. One of all, one of all, we want to develop a legal framework that incorporates the obligations under the Mineral Water Convention, as well as a structure which will administratively, I mean, provide some implementation strategies for that purpose. And also, we want to phase out mercury added products for the health sector. And then we also want to reduce and where feasible eliminate use of mercury in ASGM, as I mentioned. We want to reduce emissions and releases from mercury point source categories. We want to also manage mercury waste in an ESM environmental manner and then reduce or limit exposure to humans and the environment. So, as part of a strategy to implement 
F um, issues, and then uh, what they call it, attain some development in line with the 2030 agenda. We at the moment are developing a 10 year strategy for sound nuclear chemicals and waste, which Minamata Convention features so importantly. And if I'll mention, because I don't have much time, you gave me only five minutes, I just want to highlight on the strategy which we want to put in place to actually, I mean, um, streamline or help protect our people and environment from chemicals, including mercury. So first of all, we trying to identify, implement and enforce measures that will prevent and where not feasible, minimize harm from chemicals, including mercury from a life cycle approach. And also to, uh, generate relevant data and information, making the data available, accessible to all our stakeholders to enable informed decisions and actions on chemicals, including mercury. We want to identify and prioritize emerging issues of national and international concern, which may also come from mercury or Minamata Convention and other conventions promoting sustainable consumption and production through the use of safe alternatives and innovative solutions to prevent or minimize risks to the environment. We want to identify and mobilize adequate and sustainable financial and non-financial resources for actually achieving chemicals management and waste. And then we want to mainstream, very importantly, mainstream and integrate the issue of chemicals and waste, including mercury issues, into the national development agenda as a way of and which, an, which an essential element for attaining the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. So we believe that through the effort of UNEP and other stakeholders at the national level and other UN bodies like UNIDO, UNEP, UNITA, and um, WHO and others, if we are able to implement such policies, we are sure of attaining sustainable development in maybe in the long run, but also as a, a short gap measure, by 2030, we we'll move forward. So I believe that um, with these few interventions, Ghana is thankful to UNAP through its 50 years existence by helping us protect our people from chemicals which are harmful to the environment as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sam, for for drawing, showing our, our participants the broad scope of the Minamata Convention and then drawing it through your broader challenges on chemicals and waste and how those are helping meet the sustainable development goals. That was really useful. And now I'm, I'm so pleased that we're joined by Sophia Tingstorp. Uh, she is the senior advisor at the Stockholm Plus 50 Secretariat within the Ministry of Environment in Sweden. Um, and Sophia has been working with substantial uh, content and business involvement towards Stockholm Plus 50. Uh, she's been involved in global chemicals issues such as uh, SICM, the Beyond 2020 process, sustainable consumption and production, and was earlier the focal point for the Minamata Convention. Um, so we are so pleased, Sophia, to, to have you enlighten us about this the Stockholm Plus 50 events and how it relates to all this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, dear colleagues, let, let me start by thanking UNEP and the Minamata Secretariat for arranging this event and also such focus on the birth of UNEP and the youngest convention, Minamata. Uh, Sweden has a long-standing priority for facing out to Mercury and we are a strong supporter of your work in, in this. Uh, let me continue with the, the Stockholm Plus 50. Five decades after the watershed moment in 1972, a, a, mo a, a moment where we recognize the centrality of the environment for human well-being and, and the need for an anchoring in institution in, in the United Nations, the UNEP. Stockholm again welcomes the world in June 2022 to focus on Stockholm Plus 50, a healthy planet for the prosperity of all. Sweden is grateful for the trust given to it to host the meeting with the support of Kenya. And the title of Stockholm Plus 50 meeting calls attention to the fact that our challenges are in 
interconnected. A healthy planet and the prosperity of all is essential to achieve sustainable development and to ensure the well-being of this and future generations. It will also be an occasion to raise awareness on, on the importance of protecting our planet as a contribution to the environmental dimension of sustainable de uh, development. Stockholm Plus 50 would also offer an op op opportunity for nations and stakeholders to work across silos addressing complex nexus is issues and it could serve as a platform for identifying solutions and actions that can drive in implementation for a whole of government and a whole of uh, civil society approach, leaving no one behind. Free leadership dialogues will make up the very heart of Stockholm Plus 50. The leadership dialogues will result in recommendations for the future. And our ambition is to refine our relationship with nature by taking further steps to achieve a net zero carbon, nature positive and a zero pollution societies. We hope that the words implementation, interconnectivity and intergeneration will frame the path towards Stockholm. Colleagues, uh, the meeting in 22 lies ahead of us like a string of pearls. Let's make use of all these meetings to advance our joint agenda. Stockholm is not the first stop on, on the trail. Next year, we'll first gather in, in Nairobi to hold the UN Environment Assembly and, and to celebrate UNEP at 50, the cornerstone and the leading authority, uh, sorry, environment authority in the UN. The General Assembly invited UNEA to provide its input as appropriate to Stockholm Plus 50. UNEA, including the Convention, has a unique insight in, into the free planetary crisis, climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution, and what this means for our future. We hope for strong messages out of UNEA. To conclude, we have a opportunity and, and common responsibility to work towards a healthy planet for the prosperity of all, leaving no one behind. It's our hope that the moment will be seized in, in Stockholm and we jointly make 2022 the start of true transformation. I thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia, and, and our thanks and the world's thanks to you to Sweden as well for the leadership role in the Minamata Convention and for hosting the actually the first intergovernmental negotiating committee meeting towards the Minamata Convention and, and all the work uh, following that on environmental governance. Thank you so much. Our final uh, panelist is Mr. Dixon Ho. Uh, Dixon uh, engages with youth globally as the facilitator for the chemicals and waste platform for the children and youth major group to UNEP. And he is a steering committee member of that group. And he is a founding member of Australian Youth for International Climate Engagement, working group with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, and then prior to his work in the environment sector, he was Yay, a high school chemistry teacher in Melbourne, Australia, and he now works on UNEP Jeff project evaluations, uh, including for a few Minamata initial assessments in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so with that, Dixon, I would love to hear your remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne, and um, thanks to all the participants who've come come to listen, and thanks to all the panelists who went before me. You know, it's great to hear the story that uh, that brought us to where we are today. Um, and I just want to thank the team here, the Marianne Minamata Secretariat, um, and UNEP for giving the youth some space to speak, um, and particularly the youth perspective on the future of UNEP uh, and the Minamata Secretariat. Now, with the five minutes I have with you today, I'd like to talk to you about three kind of things that uh, the youth around the world kind of feel, um, and also four things perhaps to think about for uh, UNEP to 100, um, if if that's even on our radar at the moment. So for the last 11 months, um, I've had the privilege of listening to the global youth on the, the, the issues of chemicals and waste and pollution. 
Um, and I know that this is only one of the three planetary crises, but I think it's, it's cross-cutting. Like, the youth around the world feel all three of these. Um, so the first one is um, there's an overwhelming sense of powerlessness with the youth. Um, there's, there's this sense that we can't do very much. Um, and in the developing world, it's more it's, it's just our feelings of uh, being unheard. There's no structures and mechanisms to help us. Uh, and then with the developed world, it's more of a sense of there's these behemoth organizations that we're working against um, if we want to do anything more than paper straws and, and, and plastic cups. Um, uh, and the second thing is this, we, we kind of see this clear, uh, uneven distribution of costs and benefits um, that, 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 you know, uh, that, that push and reinforce the old inequalities and legacy power structures that we've seen in play. Um, so, and there's this kind of stark difference between uh, the youth in uh, weird countries, so Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic countries, um, they reap a lot of the benefits of the, the, the chemicals, of the chemicals uh, around the world, but um, the downstream and the, also the mining, the upstream costs uh, costs are all borne by kind of the youth of the developing nations. And so we kind of want to point out that there's this, this disparity and like it's, it's, we're in such a globalized world, it's no longer out of mind and out of sight. Um, and the last one, not least, is that the, we have concerns about the capacity to bring change. Uh, in the developing world, it's more about institutionally capacity where there are laws and then there are, you know, signatories, but it's, it's hard to enforce these things uh, on the ground. Uh, but also a community, there's a low kind of like chemical literacy uh, around and these things are quite abstract uh, and so it, it's one of those those are the concerns in the developed world we're in the developed world um the youth are kind of tired of being told go get a degree do some research and if you find the technological silver bullet we'll listen to you um i think that that's it kind of reinforces these these systems that that, that keep us out of the structure and then so um by 2071 Right. If everything works out, I won't be this young whippersnapper before you here today, and hopefully I'll be more mature, kinder, and a wiser 81-year-old. And um, finally, be able to say, you know, I've had a life well lived with little regrets. But what about UNEP and what about Minamata? You know, will the next five decades, will you reach the end of that next five decades and say, look, we spent the last 50 years well and we have little regrets. What will your legacy be and what will the pages of history remember? Um, and I... <laughs> um, of all the people on this panel are least qualified to talk on this topic, but I, what I can bring to you is what the youth need of UNEP in the next 50 years. Uh, and so um, what I will talk to you is kind of um, the four things that we kind of need you to be. Uh, first of all, was we need a UNEP that's more integrated than ever before. As the world becomes more and more globalized and interconnected, UNEP and its secretariats and the UN system in general needs cannot stay isolated any longer. We can't work in silos. We can't just choose selected uh, stakeholder groups. You know, externally, this might look like a whole of society approach. UNEP and Minamata needs arms in all sorts of areas in society, in industry, in private sector, in academia. Um, in, and in, in, even internally, right, There's, there needs to be less of these barriers in between the UN agencies, the secretariats and the teams. There needs to be more horizontal structure, right? Staff might be able to go from one secretariat to another and, and they might have many people to report to. Uh, and that's that way, you know, innovation and ideas can freely flow across UNEP and all of its secretariats. Uh, secondly, is that we need a UNEP that's more effective than ever before. And um, there's no doubt that UNEP has been effective in the last 50 years. Um, and, but in the last 50 years, under UNEP's watch, um, there's still the, the, the triple crises have gotten worse. Um, and I'm not criticizing. And this is before the 1.52 degrees Celsius of climate change. This is before this kind of post-truth era that we're living in when we don't believe the science and policy. Uh, and also this is before the COVID pandemic. Uh, and so in the next 50 years, we know all of the, your reports have said it's gonna get worse. Um, and so we're coming out of the pan and into the fire. Uh, and, um, you know, these, these issues, they don't respect these um, imaginary lines we call sovereign borders. Uh, and UNEP is kind of the only organization that's uniquely capable of carrying us through those next 50 years. Uh, and so it needs to be exponentially more effective than ever before. Um, and just to, to top that, um, UNEP has to be more efficient than ever before. You know, it's, it's, if it's going to get worse from now onwards, we need a UNEP that can move and move fast. Um, in a crisis, we need a crisis response team. And when those response teams need an appropriate response time. Now we can't afford to wait 20 years anymore. Uh, these long response times means more people die. Uh, and, and I think that we need to have more efficient. Uh, there, might, yeah, there are some things that might work more efficiently. 
And last but not least, is we need a unit that gives us a reason to be optimistic. Um, the sentiment, I think, uh, I want to borrow from Noam Chomsky, which is a philosopher and a, and a, a, a philosophy guy, a professor. Um, and he says that there are two choices. We can either be pessimistic, give up, and ensure that the worst can happen, or that we can be optimistic, grasp the opportunities that surely exist, uh, and help to make, make the world a better place. And that's not really much of a choice. Um, and every time when I talk to the youth, uh, it's absolutely heartbreaking sometimes when I hear the despair in the voice of the youth um, in those global consultations. And I think that Minamata and UNEP, you know, we, your comparative advantage is this sentiment, is this opportunity, is this hope that says that we can build a better world and we're going to work together to do this. Uh, and so um, you are the organization that the youth needs for hope and optimism, because with that, it leads to action and it leads to the green and blue revolution. So with that said, as a youth, young person, I would like to recognize that we stand on the shoulders of the people who went before us um, and the work that you guys have done. Uh, and I'd like to take some time to honor, uh, to give honor where it's due and respect all the work that you guys have been putting into protecting our planet, especially for Mercury. So thanks for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, Dixon. Boy, you packed a lot of information into your five minutes and we really appreciate that. It's a lot of good guiding points for us to, to keep in mind and also the, the energy uh, that we need to take forward into the challenges ahead. So we really appreciate that. Um, so we heard a lot of great information so far. From Juan, we heard how UNEP has been addressing the issue of mercury pollution. Uh, well before the Minamata Convention entered into force, which is true, and and how UNEP has really um, advocated for the need to strengthen the science policy interface. Um, and from from Japan, from Mr. Uh, Kitagawa in uh, Japan, uh, Japan has been at the forefront of the process to adopt the Minamata Convention, and Japan continues to show great leadership. Uh, in the implementation of the convention. Uh, and from Ghana, Ghana is committed to developing the national strategies for the sound management of chemicals and waste and drawing the connection to the very, from the very specific obligations in individual conventions to the broader um, demands uh, that the sustainable development goals put before us. Uh, and Sophia reminded us that we've been had a shared uh, opportunity and responsibility really to, to work towards a healthy planet uh, and make transformational change possible. And then Dixon uh, reminds us that youth need to, to stay engaged um, and should be more integrated uh, than ever before. And, and UNEP and, and the Minamata Convention uh, can be more effective than ever before. And, perhaps more efficient and, and really to, to provide the world with an optimistic view of what can be done. So we have a, a few moments left and I believe uh, we have a couple of questions from the floor already or at least one uh, request for the floor or feel free to put your questions in the chat. We have uh, some time to take a couple of questions. Sharifal, do do we have anyone? Hi, Marian. We have Florian and I have unmuted Florian. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank you very much for, for giving me speech. I would like to uh, uh, continue with uh, Dixon's optimism and I would like to especially like to uh, thank Sophia Tinkstop for all her efforts and achievements in regard of uh, mercury free dentistry. Um, you might know that uh, uh, dental amalgam is uh, is phased out in Sweden since 2009, but Sweden did not stop there. It uh, continued to work on the European level, and uh, which led to the uh, 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 mercury regulation, which went far beyond the Minamata Convention uh, on the European level, and which is now uh, proposed to be uh, become included, become part of the uh, the, the global agreement, and. Uh, I think uh, this information and, inf and experience which were shared by, by Ms. Uh, Tingstop were so valuable and uh, um, were, were uh, taking, being a, a great part 
so that now we are we came to this stage and that the, the world knows it is possible to to have a, a dentistry without mercury so i hope this uh, uh cop four will go and make it uh yeah dental amalgam history thank you Ms. Sophia. thank you very much for that uh sophia did you want to provide any comments reactions to that uh, thank you, and thank you, Florian, for, for, for bringing this up. Yes, uh, the phasing out of mercury in the dentistry is a very Im important issue for Sweden, and we have been working very hard, and I think it's it's possibly to to, to, to do that. And so we're looking forward to the negotiations uh, on, on, on this and that uh, during the COP4. Thank you. And and if there are, if anyone's asking for the floor, if you could please uh, identify yourself and, and your country. Uh, and I'm not seeing, I, I do see one comment in the chat. Thank you for, from Imar Rafat, um, indicating that there is a waste management strategy in Egypt. So that's, that's more indication of really good progress being made. Uh, on some of these broad issues, uh, broad and specific issues. Um, Sharaful, any other requests for the floor? Marianne, so far, no more hands. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think that is probably a reflection on, on how uh, succinctly but thoroughly our speakers uh, made their remarks. Uh, so I would really, again, like to, to reiterate thanks um, to all our panelists for their really uh, interesting uh, and, and I think instructive um, remarks that really show us the way um, to, to take these broad um, concepts about international governments, uh, multilateral environmental governments, governance and put them into practice in a very practical uh, and uh, policy-based and science-based way that makes a difference on the ground. Uh, we do have another um, question in the chat from Czechoslovakia, Katka. Thank you, nice to see you here. Um, she says, we heard a lot about science-based information and evidence-based decisions. How can we overcome the current uh, post truth to all. This is a question to to any of the panelists who wish to to take that. Um, and maybe Juan, if we could start with you on that, how how to deal with uh, the current post truth as Katka describes it. Thank you. This is this is definitely a very key question, and and also one that is critical thinking about the future of the global environmental governance. The most important point there is that scientific evidence, um, of course, uh, under the understanding that, that science is, is not dogmatic, that, that science is always just uh, advancing knowledge, but that is validated and that encompasses also uncertainties the key thing is that there are certain facts that can be demonstrated and that are the basis for the discussion among amongst the various uh, constituencies. Uh, just just this um, this week, the, there was a report indicating that the um, the heat wave that has been um, observed uh, across Europe uh, uh, this year and that. Uh, they have recorded the highest uh, temperatures in history. There is no way that cannot be produced in the context of a, a global warming due to um, to human uh, driven activities. So it's, it's this kind of science that is a, available for the discussion. And, and the key thing is how to ensure that everyone has can access the knowledge and this is about democratization of knowledge and this is about enabling the science policy interface 
not only as a vehicle between scientists and politicians, but the, the general public, everyone. Uh, and this is why it's so interesting. And I ju just want to mention one, one specific case um, from Latin America and the Caribbean that they have developed this very interesting instrument, which is called the Escazú Agreement. And it's all about access rights. And one of those rights is access to information. So if we enable that and we make sure that every single person um, can have access to the available information and, and to basically to use that for their own decisions and the, their understanding of the public and, and local and regional and national problems, that uh, certainly makes a difference. So, so that's one thing. I, I would like to pick up uh, uh, taking advantage that I'm having the floor at, at, in this moment on the second question that is in the chat box. And is, uh, the question is, what would they do in the respective organizations to engage scientists more, especially to become more efficient and effective uh, as UNEP and global community? And one of the things that I would like to mention is that um, uh, member states and major groups and stakeholders are calling for a strengthening of UNEP as part of the a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of UNEP. And within that, there are very strong voices on how to further engage the scientific community, especially the, the scientists from the Global South. And that will lead us to a new approach uh, in terms of data management, data sharing, uh, data analysis, uh, the way we use data and we use analysis uh, to support decisions and to and to support policy policies uh, at all levels so that's a that's a, a big challenge and most likely will be a, one of the important outcomes of the unipat 50 celebration so that's my answer to that thank you Thank you so much. It took me a moment to get my mouse to <laughs> unmute me, but um, uh, it looks like we're out of time. I really appreciate those answers, uh, Juan, and I would have loved to turn to all of our panelists for their thoughts on these these questions. Um, but we are out of time now, so I want to thank everyone again. I want to thank all our participants. Um, and I want to uh, really encourage us all to to take heart that that uh, environment multilateral environmental governance is really um, in the spotlight right now, and it's working. Uh, it's you know there are frustrations along the way, but it's really working. Things are happening. Changes are happening to people in their communities around the globe and uh, it's thanks to the hard work of, of so many of you um, in, in countries around the world. So I want to, to thank uh, UNEP for organizing this discussion. Thanks again to our panelists and good luck to everyone for the work at hand this week, wherever you may be, including uh, at COP 4.1 and best wishes to you all. Thank you.